Good morning, welcome to Ag Talk and Roll, where I talk all about agriculture and other things that are on my mind. All right, so in the news, it's still news that the government is still shut down. Okay, so what does that mean for government workers? Well, it doesn't mean that they're not going to get paid. It just means that they're not getting paid right now. If they are forced to work, which, you know, they're supposed to be forced to work, which... I don't know how you force somebody to work. I mean, if uh, it's just like a rainy day for me, if it's raining and I can't make hay, I go find something else to do. Uh, the bills still need to be paid, right? I mean, right? Uh, if you're a government worker and you're not working, you can go pump gas, you can go to Walmart and become a greeter if that's your skill set. Uh, you can go to McDonald's, Burger King, Wendy's. There's always fast food opportunities there. There's always. I mean, right now I can go route 12 here and uh, see three signs for help wanted at restaurants and other things. Now, you're not going to get paid what you were paid as a nice cushy government job, but you could take on a job somewhere else until the government shutdown is over, in which you're still going to get paid for the furlough. Uh, so, you know, that's just my thoughts on that. I, I just never stay still. Uh, there's always, I mean, I do stay still. I come home at night and I don't want to do anything here. <laughs> you know, and there's things that need to be done here. And Teresa would like me to do them. But, you know, like yesterday it was raining. And I did a few things that I should have done two years ago. And something I should have done a week ago. But I did it. And uh, that was yesterday. So I do kind of keep busy uh, in the rain. So just think of the government furlough as a rainy day. And you guys need to get busy if you're watching this channel and you're a government worker. Uh, that's just my thoughts on it. I mean, go down to a local farmer. You know, I'm sure there's something a farmer can have you do. But uh, anyway, so what does the government shutdown mean to farmers? Uh, I see that it is a big talking point on TV that, you know, us farmers are going to be suffering because of the government shutdown. And how dare we make the farmers suffer any more than what they already are through low pricing and things like that. Um, the Farm Service Agency, uh, from what I understand, opened yesterday for business, which to me, it could stay closed permanently. I, it means nothing to me. Uh, the, the reason I don't deal with the Farm Service Agency is probably multifaceted, but the real main reason that I won't go in there is that they use the information that we give them against us. In the long run, it is used against us. Uh, I know they've got most farmers, grain farmers and beef and cattle, you know, or dairy farmers all locked in that if you don't come to the Farm Service Agency, you won't get the benefits of God knows what, whether it's insurance or even your loan officer. And a lot of guys do use the Farm Service Agency for government loans against their cattle, their grain and everything else, which I did a few times uh, when I had grain. I went to the Farm Service Agency and I got a loan against my grain so I could operate before, you know, waiting for the price to come up. <clears throat> and when the price comes up, you still have to pay interest on that money and you do have to pay it back, you know. And if you go to that USDA site and you look under my name or my, family, my family's name, you will see that there's rather absorbent in amounts of money that claims that I received from the USDA or the U.S. government through Farm Service Agency and loans and loan deficiencies, loan deficiency payments. So there's two ways to do that back when I was dealing with the, the lovely feds, um, was that you got the loan deficiency payment. A loan deficiency was uh, the difference between the actual price of corn or soybeans, wheat, bar rye, barley, whatever you had, not rye, they don't pay on rye, but barley they do. Um, canola, sunflowers. So if the price at the mill is, say, $1.75, and the, the government's set profitability number was $2.25, there was $0.50 cents per bushel of grain that they would pay you to make up the difference between the deficiency and the... Uh, you know, what you could get at the mill. Now, foolishly, foolishly, I did this once, was I took the loan. Uh, you take the loan. So now you're paying interest on this loan, and it's not much interest. It's like 2% interest, but they buy the whole number of the grain, you know. So if the 
government set price is two dollars and twenty five cents a bushel and the mill is only paying you a buck seventy five cents if you take the loan boom you got two dollars and twenty five cents to work with okay and then if you sold it you sold the grain you still have to pay back the dollar seventy five cents you're still able to keep that but you get the whole amount now it can go either way so if you and you have to prove what you sold your grain for too that's that's another silly ass thing so if you went ahead and you sold your grain for say a buck ninety or two dollars just say two dollars you only got to keep the twenty five cents and i didn't really read the fine print i thought that at the time of the purchase it was the loan was for the buck seventy five but it wasn't it was for what you sold it as now if it exceeded the two twenty five you had to pay it all back obviously with interest uh... if it stayed if it went down say uh... twenty five cents to a buck fifty and you sold it then you were it, the difference was between the buck fifty and the two twenty five and that's where you got that extra extra you know so uh... later on uh... through the farm service agency i and we haven't had a loan deficiency payment in years there hasn't been one since the early two thousands you know early like two thousand four two thousand five there was a deficiency payment i don't think there was anything after that the ldp is what they call it you may know that uh, those those initials if you are my age or maybe just a little bit younger than me but not much um, <clears throat> so uh, the best thing that I did after that was when there was a it was at a buck seventy five and I did this also it was like I, I want to say it was a dollar seventy five cents I'm just going to use that for a, a quick and easy reference a dollar seventy five cents uh, was you know okay so this is it the government's number is 225 I get 50 cents a bushel they cut me a check I had 10,000 bushels of corn so you know there you go 50 cents I got five grand so I got five thousand dollars and that was to pay fertilizer bills and whatever else I had at the time and and then I still had the grain now once you get that money they can't ask it for it back it's yours you know that was the deficiency now this is the the dice that we shook up and whoosh, rolled out onto the table uh, if the price went down you lost you know that's you, you just gambled but you still had your 50 cents so but if the price went up it's from 75 to say two dollars you still had your 50 cents plus you gained 25 cents so in in essence your two dollar and 25 cent corn just went to two dollars and fifty cent corn and I remember doing that and saying yes, you know, because it had gone up. And it had gone up to a buck ninety. I remember it was still under two dollars, and I was smiling, you know, because I had just made forty, forty, uh, yeah, whatever, forty cents. Uh, so there you go. I mean, wasn't that nice of them? I made forty cents a bushel or whatnot, and uh, is that forty cents? Yeah, that's about forty cents, thirty-five cents. Anyway, uh, I, I know my brain it just doesn't quite work. Seventy-five, eighty-five, ninety is, uh, you know, wow. 15 cents. Anyways, 15 cents. I made 15 cents. Sorry, my math skills suck. Um, you know, while I'm doing a live stream, I mean, I can, or not a live stream, but uh, I'm talking a raw. I can do it pretty quickly if I'm, uh, you know, I'm on my toes, you know, and it's not early morning and I can actually, uh, you know, think straight. But anyway, so you can make, you could make money that way. Now there's no LDP. Uh, and if you look on a USDA website, that only says that I took that money. They never did say on the loans that came back. You know, and that was just, those were survival years. I call them survival years. Uh, we did some other things to make uh, that corn grow, uh, that corn and soybeans grow that were quite cheap and effective. Uh, we used a product called, uh, uh, it was agroorganic ag lime, which was lime and human waste. Lime stabilized uh, human waste, which worked very well, it was pasteurized, homogenized, and sent out for us. We used it, worked good. It was cheap, you know, like seven dollars a ton for lime, high cal lime, and was fly ash and uh, human waste, which worked really well. And then later we got, uh, uh, yeah, what the hell they call that stuff? It was it came out of Ocean County Utilities. It was basically malorganite of New Jersey, and uh, that was like seven bucks a ton. Also, you know, 
seven dollars a ton and it just seemed to be the magic number and we put tons and tons and tons of that stuff on and when they got over full in their silos and they had no room for it guess what ladies and gentlemen they brought it to us for free and we poured it on so free fertilizer dollar seventy five cents for corn fifty cents for LDP bada bing bada boom we were making money because we didn't have to worry about um, putting down fertilizer other than a little bit of nitrogen and we didn't do it so often but we did use potash because there wasn't much potash in human waste for some reason but we got all the trace elements and and all the other stuff and I know some people are saying oh my god heavy metals heavy metals well no uh, we really don't have heavy metals in that stuff if they they said that if they were to test commercial fertilizer for the same the same stringency as they did human waste uh, commercial fertilizers would never be allowed to be used on the ground but because it is a byproduct and it's deemed fertilizer uh, commercially chemically it's safe and you can put it on if you want we used to get 3912 3912 uh, the phosphorus came out of the Fisher body plant from General Motors down here in New Jersey and it would settle out into three different levels in the tank we had a we had white tanks and a green tank at the time you could still see it in a green tank but they would pump it in and we wouldn't use it right away we get it early like this time of year and then you'd have one, two, three different levels of, of, of fertilizer in this tag. And I'll never forget my dad talking to Ken Totten. Kenny Totten was the fertilizer dealer out of Ringo's, New Jersey. And uh, he says, oh, don't worry about that. That's just the metal separating out. And that's what we were putting down. Now, plants do use metals and things like that. Uh, you know, not the heavy ones like cadmium and uh, mercury and shit like that, but the other things like zinc and, you know, a little bit of zinc is okay, a little copper is good, a little molybdenum is fine, um, but cadmium, that's badass, you know, you don't want that, and I'm sure we put it on. I remember taking a bath in that stuff. Uh, we had, my dad had put the tank on the back of a flathead, flatbed truck, it was a 1968 or 69 GMC, and it had a Spool on it. The thing was awesome. I mean, it really was an awesome truck. It was a flatbed with a spool, but it had an eye for the cable. So when you were, when you would uh, use this cable to pull logs and things with it, you'd run that eye, and the eye was would retract in the floor, but it stuck up about that far. And my dad had put the tank on there, and when we came up to the light in Baptist Town which it wasn't a light at the time, it was just a stop sign because he used to stop at Baptist Town, look right, look left, and go because there wasn't so many people out here. We li I lived in a dense, uh, not a densely populated area. There were no houses. It was farms with, you know, family built houses, not these uh, developments. But now we've got developments and it kind of sucks. But anyways, came up the stop sign. The tank slid forward, tearing a hole into the bottom of it. And it was a borrowed tank. It wasn't even ours. It belonged to Kenny Totten. And fertilizer spilling everywhere. So my dad went and he threw the pressure to the sprayer up as high as he could get it because we were putting down nitrogen for corn and well this 3912 and he was putting it down for uh, for uh, pre-emergence or um, yeah uh, pop-up fertilizer even though we were doing it wrong we did it because we needed it and uh, we were about a week ahead of the corn anyway so he just hit the pressure it was a high hypro pump I believe it might have been a you no, know, it was definitely it was a century sprayer with a high pro pump, um, ace pump. It wasn't high pro; it was ace. It was green. I'll never forget it. I was like 12 years old when this happened too, so it was after my grandfather had passed away. So anyhow, uh, he's putting it on, and I'm trying to stop this leak, and I'm moving hoses and pulling pumps, and he's putting it down as fast as he can, and the and the fertilizers pouring out the bottom of this tank. Um, the neighbor comes over and he's like, oh my God, you know, his name was Slim. Uh, Clarence, Clarence Lit Lightshow. Clarence Lightshow. He lived over here and uh, up off of the, what is that, Locktown Road. And that's where we were spraying this stuff, plant corn. Anyways, Clarence or Slim was friends with my grandfather. And my grandfather died a couple of years later, but Clarence was a really nice guy or slim as we always call them. Uh, he was a machinist and he taught me some machining skills on a lathe uh, which I'm not a good lathe operator. I mean I can run them and milling machines or you know I, I just I'm out of practice uh, is all. 
Uh, but he did teach me some stuff on on that, and he was just a nice guy. He moved to Florida, and I'm sure he's dead now. I, I just can't imagine he's still alive. If he is, great. I mean, he's he's been retired for 30 years. He was retired before Tim was born, long before Tim was born. And I was still driving my red and white pickup truck when he moved away. I went to the auction and bought a bunch of his junk, which I still use to this day. I mean, there's a sump pump that's at my other house that's pumping, pumping water, you know, out of the basement when it fills up. And that's my pump that I bought from Clarence. So, anyways, I don't know why I'm on this tangent. But anyways, I guess we were just talking about heavy metals. Now, uh, growing corn uh, for free, or damn close to being free, uh, is going to happen again for me because of the, uh, the spent compost. Now, a lot of guys may be wondering about spent compost, you know, uh, or have used spent compost in the past, like 10 years ago. Ten year, spent compost from 10 years ago is nowhere near as good as what it is at today's standards. Today's standards, they add a lot of fertilizers to it, fertilizers, gypsum, lime, and things like that to produce mushrooms. Mushrooms don't take what you put in it and put it into the mushroom and, you know, you know, people eat that. They don't. The only thing that's really in mushrooms is magnesium. I think it's magnesium. Uh, magnesium, and there's just not much food value to a mushroom. A mushroom is basically there to enhance the food that you're cooking. So if you throw mushrooms into your steak, uh, into your, you know, if you're cooking a steak with gravy and stuff, my mouth is watering, I'm hungry. Uh, but if you're cook, you throw mushrooms in there, the mushroom will actually absorb that, that, that flavor, give it some substance or texture to it. And as you're eating it, I never liked mushrooms, but I love them now. I really do. I think they're great. Uh, never did when I was a kid because my dad used to put them in eggs and I remember eating eggs with mushrooms in them and picking the mushrooms out. My dad's like, you better eat those mushrooms. Well, I hated them aided them. I remember in fifth grade we did a taste test and uh, Mrs. Piper, that worthless rotten bitch, I wish she would die. Um, sorry, I shouldn't talk like that. She probably is dead and if I knew where she lived I'd go uh, relieve myself on her headstone because that's how I felt about her. Uh, I told her, I said, please don't put those mushrooms in my mouth because I really, really, really dislike them. She put the mushroom in my mouth because she's a bitch and I spit it out on the table where all the other food was ruining the experiment because uh, I hate mushrooms. I hated them. So she put that in and said, "You have to, you have to chew it." And I went, mm -mm, realized it was a mushroom. <laughs> right out. I was blindfolded. Blindfolded. She deserved it. Fuck her. Anyway, that was the end of that thing. I went, got sent down to the principal's office, and was reprimanded for destroying the family or the the class project. And uh, my mom and dad were called. My dad, of course, he didn't show up. My mom did because, you know, my dad would have probably took the principal and threw him out the window. Uh, my mom was like, well, I think he did tell you that he didn't like mushrooms. And, uh, you know, of course, the teacher was mortified. And, you know, my, my fifth grade year was terrible. I, I was actually telling Teresa that it was probably the most horrific year of my life uh, in school. Uh, I still hate Mrs. Piper. And for years, I've said that if I ever walked or was on the road and I saw an accident and the person in the ditch was Mrs. Piper and she was bleeding profusely from her neck and all it would take is this finger to save her life, I would walk on. I would leave. I would let her die. That's how miserable this woman made my life. Um, but I guess it took her to make me who I am today. And uh, maybe I should be thankful for that. I don't know. I really don't know, but I do still dislike her. Maybe at some point in my life I will forgive her for her trespasses against my, against me, and um, for what she, how she made me feel. And uh, you know, I'm not a sense, I'm not overly sensitive, but that woman really made me feel like I was worthless. I remember feeling so ugly when I would wake up in the morning before I'd go to school that I couldn't look at myself in the mirror, and it wasn't because of kids. I mean, I could handle myself just fine in class, but it was that teacher. That teacher made me feel so horrible about myself that I was absent 80 days that year. 80 days or 80, 84 days or something. It was over 80 days that year. I was so sick from that teacher that I used to take, I used to claim that I was sick so I didn't have to go to school. And now if I claimed sickness long enough, my mom, it would take me to the doctor. The doctor would say, he's fine, send him back to school. So what I would do is I had a dog 
and a dog's temperature is 101 degrees. It's 101 degrees. You take it to the thermometer, your mom walks out of the room, you put it out, put it under the dog's armpit because I slept with my dog. It was a little dog, a little toy fox terrier. I love that dog, Smokey. Um, and she was 101 degrees. So I'd pull that out, put it under the dog's armpit. Arm, she, my mom would come in, if, as I'd hear her come down the hall, I'd pull it out. <laughs> dog needed a bath. But I'd stick it back in my mouth and uh, my mom would pull it out and it would say 101 degrees. The new thermometers nowadays, they're digital. I don't know if they would uh, come back down if you, you know, because now they just swipe it from your temple to your ear or to your forehead and from your forehead to your temple and you've got an accurate reading. But back in the day, we had mercury thermometers. You know, you put it in there, you had to shake them down because they wouldn't go down on their own. But anyway, I always wondered how they made those. Dirt my. Um, but anyways, that's how I got out of school because she made me feel so miserable. Uh, the other kids would go to pottery class or art class. I wasn't allowed to go. Um, gym, gym, which was my outlet. I was always good in gym. You know, I liked gym. I was pretty strong and athletic, I guess. I, I didn't really care to, to uh, sign up for teams, but in gym class, I made those kids work for it. You know, if, if we were playing team handball, which I was really good at, I was the goalie, and they had to work really hard to get one past me. Um, but anyway, I, I guess it's just a little bit of my history in fifth grade and Mrs. Piper and how she made me feel. Uh, they put me at the back of the class with a divider. They said that I was distracted. And I think I might have told this story on the other channel, but they put me in, in the back of the class with a table, me and a friend of mine, Jamie Novak, whom they did the same treatment to, which is kind of medieval. I mean, you want to isolate a kid? And I, that's what they did. They isolated us. They put us in the back of the room with this blue divider. So you had a wall in front of you and two walls down the side. And you had to sit. And it came past the desk a little bit. So you were kind of confined in there. And every once in a while, the thing would slip off the table slip off the table and become, you know, a noise, you know, it would make a noise and distract the class and, and I'd get yelled at for it and, uh, you know, of course, have to put it back on there, go down to the principal's office for distracting the whole entire class because I was a deviant. Um, Jamie Novak and I decided that we needed to see one another, so we punched a hole through the damn thing and he's at one side of the table and I'm at the other and we're looking at each other through there laughing and giggling and causing trouble. So after about a month of this thing, we decided that we should use this to our advantage. See, we couldn't see out, and she couldn't see in. So what are we doing in there? You know, what are we doing? We're making paper wasps. We're making flying darts out of needles and thread, pins and thread. I, I shouldn't say needles. They were pins because you needed the head to make the dart. Uh, so what we did was we... Back in the day, our parents used to sew a lot. You know, we had bad clothes, holes in our clothes. My parents would, my mom would darn them shut with a sewing machine, but we had spools of thread. So what we did was we swiped spools of thread, and then we would wrap that thread around our fingers. My fingers were much smaller at the time. Uh, just wrap it up like that, bite it off, pull it, twist it, stick the needle through, and then take the end, wrap it up, and you had... A dart, a flying dart. So we did those. I'll never forget, and I know the kid's name. It was David Bryant, uh, Carl's son. He got a needle in the eye right here, right in the white of his eye from Jamie. He goes, Poof! and this thing just stuck him. I don't know if it got him in the white or in the thing. And he pulled it out, and he turned to him, and he pointed at him. And he said, you're dead. So that was the end of the needles. I mean, we... We kind of heeded our own warnings. We, we got in trouble. David never said anything about it, but we did that. And, well, we were doing that. See, we were able to get away with it. Now, we decided that we still had to make projectiles and red rubber bands. You ever see those red rubber bands? They used to use them to wrap newspapers when newspapers were a thing. Uh, so we would get red rubber bands uh, from... The post office of all places and they were big and they were strong and you use your your fingers to make a slingshot with these things so you would take this rubber band 
and a paper wasp. A paper wasp is basically just notebook paper that you've cut to about an inch and a half wide. You roll it up as tight as you can and you take a piece of duct tape or electrical tape or masking tape and you wrap it and then you fold it over so it is halved and then it makes a perfect a perfect projectile. Alright, so we're doing this stuff in these in these cubicle things that they've got us blocked off in um, because we're not going to do our schoolwork. We don't have to because we're stupid. You know, we're too stupid to be in fifth grade, and uh, the uh, so we have to get creative and do things that are fun and exciting and you know troublesome, I guess, because we were already outcasts in our own class. Uh, I think if she would have taken a little more time with us, we, she could have got us to learn something, which my whole entire fifth grade year was a big F. I failed. I mean, I failed, but they passed me through because they didn't want me in fifth grade again because then I would have had to deal with that worthless teacher. Uh, so anyway, uh, we did the paper wasps. Jamie, was it Jamie? It might have been me. We would take these things and shoot them at kids. And that's what we were doing. We were shooting them at kids. And back in the day, unless you hit a girl, a girl would squeal like a pig, man. She's like, oh, my God, they hit me with this thing. You know, in your days, you were ruined. But you could hit other kids in the class with these things. And, I mean, the darts we would shoot from the back of the room clear up to the cork board to the left of the chalkboard. Yes, chalkboards. We were still in primitive chalkboards. Uh, back then, we didn't have blue screens or, or you know, things like that. It was a chalkboard, and the teacher used the chalkboard. Uh, but there was a cork board, for, or a bulletin board, as they called them. And uh, you would post, you know, all the smart kids, you know, all the cookie-cutter kids that did the, did the work, you know, flawlessly and had A's and B's, no C's or loud on the cork board. Um, they had their papers posted, and it was basically to us a. In the teacher's mind, it was supposed to. Uh, it was supposed to encourage us to do better, so that we could get our names up on the cork board. Well, when they treat you like shit and put you in the back of the room and put you in cubicles and say you're bad and you're never going to amount to anything because you're bad, uh, that was really just a. Up yours, stupid. You'll never get your name at the at the front of the uh, at the front of the room. Uh, so I mean, that's how I took it in fifth grade. Maybe that's how my mind was working. But it was me, Jamie, Danny, David. Not David Bryant, but David Pine. To a point, he went back to the front of the class later. Eric Ostermiller was another one, and uh, I can tell you, with the exception of myself, they're all. And I, I mean, I hope they're not watching this, to be honest with you. Their lives aren't what they could have been if they were encouraged to do uh, do better. You know, encouraged, not degraded. So I guess Ag Talk and Raw is turning into a uh, what not to do to kids in fifth grade because it really was it was awful. Uh, it took three years of my life to uh, of working uh, with a male teacher. The guy's name was Mr. Haney. Uh, they shipped me out of Kingwood School, basically kicked me out of Kingwood School. They didn't want me there anymore because I brought down their their average uh, along with Danny. They they actually wanted him out of school so so fast they skipped him a grade. They skipped him ahead two grades to get him through the system a year, two years ahead of ahead of schedule. Uh, they put him in a special class where he was to be, you know, pampered through. Uh, they had teachers that did the work for him. And uh, I actually got out of fifth grade for two periods a day. Uh, I went down to the special education where Mrs. Ormosi, sweet woman, her husband was the gym teacher who was a prick, by the way. Uh, if you weren't good in sports, he was terrible. He made a better college basketball coach, and that's what he did. And I, I heard that he was really good college basketball coach for Kutztown University. Then he did a high school, or a grade school gym teacher. Uh, him and Eric Ostermiller absolutely hated one another. And I'll never forget Eric Ostermiller being forced to sit along the wall while we all played. Um, and it was basketball because Mr. Ormosi loved basketball. But Mrs. Ormosi, she was a sweet woman. And I'm sure Mr. Ormosi was a pretty good guy, too. Uh, he just was unhappy in his job. 
So Eric Oscar Miller sitting along the wall, and he's making faces at everybody, you know, just striving some for some form of attention. Uh, we weren't getting the attention that we needed in the classroom, and Jim was good to us. We liked it. I mean, Eric liked it too, but he, you know, we were singled out because we were the dummies. Uh, and I'll never forget Mr. Ramosi taking that basketball and winging it at his head and Eric ducking the ball as it just skimmed the top of his head and he didn't do it once he didn't do it twice he did it at least ten times while he sat there along that wall so Eric ended up on drugs and alcohol causing a big mess in his life he is my age 46 years old and he is just now just now getting his life in order over the last couple of years and he may watch these videos I don't know but I liked Eric um, we all, after fifth grade, was it fifth grade? No. In third grade, I went to a Christian school where we were like a family. So third and fourth grade, I repeated the third grade. And then fourth grade, I uh, uh, was in Christian, fifth, third and fourth grade. Twice, second time for third grade in the Christian school. Fourth grade, I was in the Christian school and I was advancing. I was actually at the end of my fourth grade year working on fifth grade uh, curriculum so that I could get caught up. And become a you know get back into my class my graduating class and then in, at the end of fourth grade the headmaster was awarded a church where he could uh, where he was going to be the minister um, Luke Kilgore was his name good guy liked him a lot uh, he became he got his his father's church because his father was a minister also Baptist Baptist uh, it was non-denominational church that he went in into uh, but Lou was uh, he liked the ladies a little too much and he got too friendly with some parishioners and ended up losing his church and I don't he was married to what a mess but anyhow um, the uh, the Christian school closed down I went into fifth grade and then I slid back further than I was uh, before that so fast forwarding out of fifth grade and I don't know how in the hell I got onto my this subject from fertilizer and the government but school is a government business anyway um, I think that school public school in the beginning is just like any other government program it starts out with good intention uh, to educate their students and then it becomes a business and I don't have any intentions of sending William to public school uh, me and Teresa have talked about this a little bit and I really don't want William to go to public school I don't want him to be homeschooled because I don't agree with that uh, it just doesn't have a place in this day and age and uh, I, I don't I just don't know I know several people that are homeschooled and then when life hits them in the face they're not prepared for it that was more for farmers and ranchers and things like that where public schools and private schools weren't even available you know on the prairies I think we've out, outgrown that um, but I, I would definitely uh, look into a private school a quality private school not one of these weird uh, you know uh, what the hell do they call those things? Montessori schools, what a joke. That is stupid as hell, too. Personally, I think it is. Uh, they only go to sixth grade, and then when you get to sixth grade, you're like, oh, uh, what do you mean i got to leave this uh, atmosphere of I can do whatever the hell I want, and now I have to actually be told what to do. So, But anyway, yeah. Uh, so when I went into sixth grade, I, I was... I was really severely retarded. <laughs> I mean, and retarded, I mean, not in a, a negative way, but slow. I was, I was behind. I was slow. I was delayed. Um, and that is what I was. I was retarded uh, in, in school. So sixth grade, I end up with a guy by the name of Mr. Haney. Uh, I was with Mr. Haney for three years until the eighth grade. Uh, when I graduated eighth grade, I went to my friend's eighth grade graduation at Kingwood School where they called my name. Now I had already graduated like three or four days earlier from the school that I had gone to, Round Valley School, uh, public school, Round Valley Public School, uh, where I did not have many friends. Uh, they were a bunch of uppity, snooty, yuppie, spawned pricks. Uh, I am not friends with anyone from that school. Uh, at all, and I think I have talked about the school a little bit. Was uh, the the guy uh, Heath Campbell, who is the the local Nazi? Uh, I was friends with him uh, until I graduated. He was two years younger than I am. 
or two grades behind me. He was three years younger than me. Uh, but anyways, with that, I got into high school and things clicked. You know, high school is high school will either make you or break you. Uh, I think that I found I fell into a group of kids that were like me, troublesome. You know, troubled behind. Um, I never did drugs. I didn't do that stuff. I would go to parties from time to time and have a beer or two, but I never, I never got shitty ass drunk and stupid like most of most people do. Um, you know, that's just what it was. Uh, yeah, I got out of high school and started my career farming. Didn't know what I was going to do, but I did it, and here I am. So, I guess all that shit didn't matter. But anyway, uh, let's go back to the government and the government shutdown and what it means for farmers. I don't think the government shutdown means anything for farmers. As a matter of fact, I'm tired of being a bargaining chip for the government and their U.S. Farm Bill. Um, we're bargaining chips for nothing. Uh, we don't get what everybody thinks we get. Everybody, every non-ag person thinks that the U.S. Farm Bill is, what, $800 billion or $80 billion for uh, us farmers to produce food for them. We get such a small, minute portion of that money, it's not even worth going into the office, so it can stay closed. That's fine by me. Um, I do feel that the border wall does need to be built uh, for a simple reason, is how do you keep unwanted people out of your country? Uh, I watched the cadaver speak, and she's like, ah, we need a technological wall. Well, unless there are drones with Stinger or Hellfire missiles or, you know, 30 millimeter cannons, I don't think that her virtual technological wall is going to work. You know, I mean, could you imagine being a, a, an illegal someone that is about to become an illegal immigrant into our country, hearing a wondering for a few seconds, and then nothingness. I mean, come on. Or hearing the rush of a and then an explosion. Are, are your buddies going to want to take that risk? I'm all for the virtual wall. I want to see chunks and pieces of people getting blown to bits on our border. And those caravans saying, hey, fuck that shit, I'm going back. Uh, so, Nancy Pelosi, if you're going to build a virtual wall with sensors drones, I want Hellfire, Stinger, or 30 millimeter cannons on those drones. Please, that's that's okay by me. Kill these motherfuckers, because they're just planning to kill us later on, whether it be financially, our country collapsing, our economy collapsing, because they just don't pay the taxes, they don't declare that they're even working, they send all of our money back to their home country because we allow it. I don't think the American people would allow this business to happen if it was actually given, uh, actually up to us as the American people. Now, I got kicked off of Instagram uh, for a while because I said that the American people, American public uh, men, women, patriots from across the country should amass on the border with their... Hmm, Defense mechanisms, I have to be careful what I say because I can get kicked off of here also, um, and defend our country. Uh, we can defend our country, right? Isn't it our right to defend our country? Isn't it in the oath that Nancy and dumbfuck Chuck uh, took, the uh, oath to defend and uphold the Constitution of the United States of America for its people? I mean, I'm sure I can find that oath and read it aloud. Uh, if you ask me, they are breaking that oath by denying the wall to protect us. I mean, we have scores of people that say there, you know, we have politicians saying there's no crisis, but we have scores of people that stand up and say, my loved one was killed by an illegal alien. Well, one death by an illegal alien, to me, means there's a problem. But when you have 10, 15, 20, 50, 100, 200, 300, 500, 1,000 people standing up saying that my daughter was raped, my son was murdered, my, my kids were, are strung out on drugs that come across the Mexican border because they're open 
uh, I think there's a crisis there. When you have border patrol agents that are, their hands are tied, they're literally, their hands are tied. You, you're underfunded. You don't have the means or the ability to go out and stop this activity from happening. The cheapest thing you can do is build a wall, a good wall, uh, a good wall. I, I don't agree with the wall design. I really don't. I think that the wall design should be solid. I don't think we should be able to see into Mexico, and I certainly don't think that Mexico should be able to see into the United States. Uh, the reason being is because if you've got a gap in the wall, you can still pass drugs through it. Okay? Uh, drugs and whatever, if that's, if that's what you're into. Uh, personally, I think it should be solid, rock solid. It should be concrete up 10 feet, and then if you want to have you know, a ventilated thing, a wall or a see-through wall. But the problem with the see-through wall is you can grab the sides of it like this and climb the wall. So it doesn't matter if it's 30 feet. You just got to be brave to do it. Uh, I say we, if you're going to do that, make the edges of that wall razor sharp. Just razor so when you grab a hold of it, it cuts through your fucking fingers. You know, that sort of a thing. Uh, because... Where there's a will, there's a way. I mean, of course you can't stop them from bringing ladders, and that's where the sensors would be involved. Um, but they're not going to do that. So uh, when Nancy stands up and says we need a technological wall, a wall is technological. It is built and designed for a specific purpose, which is a technology. Whether it be an ancient technology, an old technology, or a modern technology, uh, it is still technological. So Nancy... Get your polydent out because your dentures aren't in straight. Learn to talk without your teeth flopping around in your mouth. And learn to think and understand that anything that you put up as a barrier is technological. technological. Uh, whether it be concrete steel, barbed wire, razor wire, or drones with stinger hellfire or 30 millimeter cannons, um, or just plain old sensors in the desert that alert Border Patrol agents that are housed every 500 yards. Uh, that's okay. You know, pretty good guys, man. 500 yards here, 500 yards here. That's 250 yards shot either way, so you can cross fire. So when the sensor goes off, sentry over here and sentry over here, whether they dart this way or dart this way, they're still with, well within range for a 5.5, five, yeah, 5.5, five, 6.45. Five, five. If you really want to go for them, go 308, you know. Uh, that'll do it. Uh, so, yeah, don't build a wall, put sensors up, but with sentry stations with men in them, men and women. Let's, let's be unisex here. You can have a man here and a woman here. Women make better shots anyway from what I'm, what I'm understanding. So, But anyhow, that is my call to get off of here. And uh, just a little bit mellow, I guess. Uh, get a little history lesson on me and how uh, my school years went. And hopefully you enjoyed this. If not, I'm sorry. If you did, give me a thumbs up. And don't forget to hit the subscribe button. Thanks for watching.